a phone call from David Morgan, uh, the David Morgan, who everyone knows, the silver guru, who I've been very tight with for a very long time. I owe David a lot. Um, he he helped me a lot in this industry back in the day. And, and this was another example. He called me up before he called anyone. And he said, I will hook you up if you want before I let anyone else know about this. He said, there's a group here in Washington I've been working with forever. Uh, they've been recycling silver out of medical devices. They're called Pyromet. They'd like to throw their hat in the ring and they'll make 100 ounce bars. And these were the ugliest 100 ounce bars you've ever seen in your life. In fact, they just said 100 ounces. They didn't say what? 100 ounce what? And for months, we, and then he talked to some other dealers, Pyromed 100 ounce bars were the only thing you could buy, literally, the only thing that you could buy in North America. And this probably would have been July, August. By October, early November, the Royal Canadian Mint and the U.S. Mint finally started to say, all right, we'll take orders. With silver at $9 an ounce, you would pay $17 or $18 to receive your silver and you'd wait anywhere from 12 to 16 weeks to get it had to pay up front Sheckman begins by posing a fundamental question how many people believe that gold is manipulated he asserts that the manipulation of gold prices is not just a theory but a reality that has persisted for a long time according to him the hallmark of this manipulation is the counterintuitive behavior of gold prices especially during times of crisis when one would expect gold to surge as a safe haven asset Instead, what often happens is the opposite gold prices are driven down, a phenomenon Sheckman attributes to the actions of powerful entities selling short on the exchanges. Sheckman discusses how, during periods of market collapse or geopolitical turmoil situations where gold should logically appreciate its price often declines. He challenges the common explanation that these price drops are due to traders rushing to liquidity, selling off their most liquid assets, including gold, to cover margin calls. Sheckman finds this reasoning unconvincing and instead suggests that these price drops are a deliberate attempt by the powers that be to mitigate the impact of the market correction. By suppressing the price of gold, they aim to delink the rationale that drives people to own it as a hedge against instability. Sheckman provides a vivid example from the 2008 financial crisis when gold prices plummeted from $1,000 to $700 and silver from $21 to $1.09. Despite these significant price drops, the demand for physical gold and silver surged to unprecedented levels. Mints across the globe, including the S Mint, the Rand Mint in South Africa, the Perth Mint in Australia, and others, were unable to keep up with the demand. This situation led to severe shortages, long delays, and substantial premiums on physical metals, even as their paper prices were collapsing. Sheckman recalls how, during this period, he struggled to source any physical product for his clients, underscoring the disconnect between the paper market and the physical market. Sheckman highlights the disparity between the paper market, where prices are often manipulated downwards, and the physical market, where demand remains strong and supplies are scarce. He recounts how refiners and other suppliers were desperate to secure any physical gold or silver they could find, even as the official prices suggested there was little interest in these metals. This distortion between the paper price and the physical reality is a recurring theme in Sheckman's analysis, one that he believes reveals the true extent of market manipulation. Now we'll show you the best clips of the latest interview, but first hit the like button, smash the subscribe button and turn on notifications so you do not miss out our daily recaps. I wonder how many people out there think that gold is manipulated. That's the first question. Uh, I know some of the guests on your show don't really think it is. I think it is. In fact, I think it's unequivocally manipulated and has been for a very long time. And that's the first premise because the hallmark of the manipulation has been counterintuitive price action. And, you know, whether it be the start of a war um, or a market collapse or whatever it may be, when we think the price of gold should be flying quite often, the the folks in charge will sell short on the exchanges and drive the price down. Now, every time that happens in the middle of, or in the midst of a market correction, stock market correction, that is attributed to traders rushing to liquidity, throwing out the baby with the bathwater, trying to, you know, grab their most liquid asset and use it to pay off margin debt or whatnot. I don't know that I believe it. Um, I, I think, you know, it's it's an attempt, I believe, of the powers that be to to mitigate 
the outcome of the correction. It's it's to mitigate the thrust and the drive, not only to accumulate gold, but to delink the rationale that people would employ for owning it. Oh, it's an archaic relic of the past. It's, you know, it's a barbarous relic. It doesn't, it's not inversely correlated. See, the market collapses and look what happens. And, and you know, even if I'm wrong, even if it truly is a rush to liquidity and the price falls, if we go back to 2008, that's a great example. And we've talked a lot about this, you and I, over the years, but in 2008, when the market collapsed, um, we saw immediately the price of gold and silver get clobbered. And um, gold fell from 1,000 to 700 and silver from 21 to 9. And one would think in an environment where the price of, of asset A and B fell by 30 and 60% respectively, that there's no demand for that, that it's, it's being dumped globally and the price is just cascading down but that really wasn't the case because in 2008, every single mint across the globe was shut down. Ultimately, the U.S. mint was shut down seven or eight times that year and really was the model of inefficiency, much more so than they were the last three or four years. But it was much deeper than that. The Rand Mint in South Africa for the first time in its 60, 70 year history was sold out of product. The Perth Mint that summer, August on, took no new business. That's it. We're out. And the Austrian mint and the Canadian mint were anywhere from 12 to 16 weeks back ordered. The, the U.S. mint, at the time, I was very close with a man who's no longer at uh, Prudential Beige. He was the, the gentleman who nominated us to be an authorized reseller. And I, I would call him and talk with him quite a bit. And I remember having conversations with him. And he would say, listen, man, you know, there's nothing you can do. We cannot take any orders right now. We'll let you know when you can. But everything's gone. <clears throat> now, what was unusual to me, and this has really shaped my 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 view of, of the physical world, is, is that the price was getting clobbered on paper, yet everything was gone. And it wasn't just that the mints were out of product. Refiners from, from Germany, or Ireland rather, would call me and say, listen, you know, I, I've seen you before online. I know who you are. I've seen your conferences. Uh, we have accounts at Delaware Depository, they would say. Uh, our traditional supply chains in Switzerland and Germany are gone. They're dried up. We'll take anything that you'll give us. I would lay in bed at night and say to my wife, I think we're going out of business. Um, I can't get anything. We can't place an order. And it also underscores, you know, no one was selling. Nobody. I mean, nobody. And, and the public wasn't selling, even with the price getting clobbered. Nobody was selling. Everyone's freaking out. And I would say, what are we going to do? You know, there's no secondary product. We've sold everything in our vault. We can't get anything. The U.S. Mint says, we'll call you. Don't call us. Uh, and then I get a, a phone call from David Morgan, uh, the David Morgan, who everyone knows, the silver guru, who I've been very tight with for a very long time. I owe David a lot. Um, he he helped me a lot in this industry back in the day. And, and this was another example. He called me up before he called anyone. And he said, I will hook you up if you want, before I let anyone else know about this. He said, there's a group here in Washington I've been working with forever. Uh, they've been recycling silver out of medical devices. They're called Pyromet. They'd like to throw their hat in the ring and they'll make 100 ounce bars. And these were the ugliest 100 ounce bars you've ever seen in your life. In fact, they just said 100 <laughs> ounces. They didn't say what, 100 ounce what? And for months we, and then he talked to some other dealers, Pyromet 100 ounce bars were the only thing you could buy, literally the only thing that you could buy in North America. And this probably would have been July, August. By October, early November, the Royal Canadian Mint and the U.S. Mint finally started to say, all right, we'll take orders. With silver at $9 an ounce, you would pay $17 or $18 to receive your silver, and you'd wait anywhere from 12 to 16 weeks to get it. You had to pay up front. Fast forward to March 2020. During the COVID-19 pandemic-induced market collapse, and Schechtman points out a similar scenario. As the market crashed, the price of silver fell to $11 per ounce. Yet, in the physical market, it was impossible to purchase silver for less than $1.20 per ounce, with substantial delays in delivery. Schechtman notes that these periods of distorted pricing are often short-lived, as bargain hunters quickly snap up available inventory, leading to further shortages and even higher premiums. 
Schechtman also touches on the role of BRICS nations Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa in the gold market. He believes these nations, along with others, have been accumulating gold at suppressed prices, taking advantage of the manipulation in the Western markets. He warns that once these countries have secured enough gold, the manipulation will end and the price of gold will surge dramatically. Schechtman predicts that the corrections in the gold market will become increasingly shallow as these nations continue their accumulation efforts. We can go back as recent as March of 2020 when the market collapsed and what happened? I think it was pretty much coinciding, if I'm not mistaken. I think silver fell to 11 bucks. Um, mm -hmm. And you remember, you couldn't buy anything for short of 20 bucks anywhere. And you'd have to wait. And you didn't know there was uncertainty. So anytime that you distort reality, there is the unintended consequence on the physical market where there are people who understand what's really happening. The value hunters say, I'll buy, thank you very much. And 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 as the world is getting scarier, you look at it and say, well, geez, I mean, the price is nine bucks or 11 bucks and I have to pay 20? Uh, how does that work? So the bottom line is, is that every single time I have seen this happen, you have about 10 minutes <laughs> to react. Yeah, if you are really, really good and really lucky, when the market collapses and you feel like catching a, a falling knife, you probably have a day or two where you could do it. But it has been my experience that that's about it because everything like that gets gobbled up at bargain hunter prices. And it's a distortion. It's all the same as the, the powers that be pushed oil down to negative $40 a barrel. How'd they do that? It's, it's the tail wagging the dog. It's the futures market controlling the price. And so in an environment where the BRICS nations and the rest of the world are massively accumulating gold, I don't expect them to be able to hold the price down very long. You look at the corrections lately, they're very shallow. But if they are and, they, and they're able to do what we saw in 08 and in 2020, within a, just a few days, the premiums were as much as 100% of the product with substantial delivery delays or more than 100%. So it's a tricky one. If you're really good and really lucky, you may get away with it, but it wouldn't be my preferred plan of action going into what we're about to go into. Another critical point Sheckman raises is the price discrepancy between the Western markets and the Shanghai Metals Exchange. He notes that for some time, the price of silver in Shanghai has been consistently higher than in the West, offering a significant arbitrage opportunity for traders. This discrepancy, he argues, is a clear indicator that the Western prices are artificially low and do not reflect the true value of silver. Schechtman believes that as the manipulation continues, this arbitrage will only grow, further distorting the market. Schechtman concludes by stating that the real price of gold and silver is unknown due to years of distortion through low interest rates and easy money policies. He argues that these metals have been deliberately suppressed, preventing them from expressing their true value. However, he is confident that this suppression cannot continue indefinitely, with central banks and governments around the world increasingly turning to gold as a reserve asset. Sheckman believes the prices of gold and silver will eventually skyrocket, surpassing even the most optimistic predictions. I don't know that if it really is what the real price. So in Shanghai for for a long time now the price of silver has been much higher than in the West. It started out 2 bucks higher, 250, 3, 350. Four bucks higher on the Shanghai Metals Exchange, and I think that's well below what it should be, but it's enough to entice the idiotic traders who have the ability to buy in the West and to deliver in the East. That's a pretty hefty arbitrage for them when you're talking millions of ounces. Um, so, yeah, I think this is certainly something that you could see being raised higher and higher and higher and higher to to arbitrage everything that isn't nailed down. And, and so... You know, with all the talk of revaluing gold and uh, gold anyway in the gold revaluation account these days, uh, Senator Cynthia Loomis, the senator from Wyoming, talking about using it to fund the Bitcoin strategic account that Trump talked about when she spoke at the Bitcoin convention in Tennessee. The real price of gold and silver, no one knows what the hell it is. That's the truth, because of all of the distortions in asset prices over the last half a dozen years due to low interest rates and easy money. The one things that were stepped on and weren't allowed to over express themselves were gold and silver. And just based by the acquisition and by the backing of when you look at the BIS and the and the IMF plans for cryptocurrencies or, or central bank digital currencies, it all seem to be pegged to gold to some degree. 
whether it be the unit or the or the report that came out of the IMF saying gold is a barbarous relic uh, or an international reserve current currency, a barbarous relic, no more question mark, or the uh, Kristalina Georgieva, the head of the IMF saying, you know, CBDC is not pegged to something would be would be fiat. They're all talking about gold. And I think the price is way distorted. And these countries have been using the, the suppression of the West to, to accumulate. And when they all have it, that suppression will end. It will end badly. You can only manipulate a market by pushing in the direction it's going, at least for an extended period of time. And these countries are now, like I've been saying, motivated, coordinated, sophisticated, and wealthy. And they are using every chance they get to drain the system, using these Western prices, which are artificial. They are not real. And even though they're higher in Shanghai to entice arbitrage, they're not real. They're not real, even remotely real. Um, and they'll be much higher based upon the amount of currency creation and based upon the projects that are coming and what it means to, I think, install confidence in a system that's dying for some confidence, dying for some something real, um, because we've squandered that, uh, you know, ad nauseum. Uh, so, yeah, I think gold and silver will go higher than anyone thinks possible. 100%. And what we see in Shanghai is just the very beginning of it. I think before it's all said and done, you'll see them jack prices up more and more and more and more in the last ditch attempt to, to siphon away anything from this fraudulent Western system.